adult spinal deformity has been gaining significant attention over the last decade as complexities of spinal deformities in this disease spectrum are becoming understood. It is increasingly being recognized as a disease entity that extends far beyond a seemingly benign adolescent idiopathic scoliosis that persists into adulthood. Good morning, I am Maureen Velasco and I will be discussing current information on the definition, epidemiology, etiology, and pathophysiology of adult spinal deformity. Adult spinal deformity is one of the most challenging spinal disorders and by definition describes a heterogeneous spectrum of abnormalities in the lumbar and the thoracolumbar spine that present in adulthood. It is characterized by three-dimensional abnormalities that can include any combination of deformities affecting the actual coronal and sagittal planes, exerting significant impacts on the health-related quality of life. Global populations are witnessing an upward shift in societal age distribution because of several factors including increased longevity, improved medical care, and declining natality. With the higher proportion of healthy elderly subjects, the incidence and prevalence of ASD is on the rise, with Schwab et al. reporting a prevalence of 32% to as high as 68% in the older population. The spectrum of adult spinal deformities include de novo scoliosis, progressive adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, adult sagittal imbalance, segmental deformity, and regional deformity due to multiple degenerative disc disease with global deformity. I will start my discussion with the two main categories of adult scoliosis based on etiology, which are de novo scoliosis and progressive adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Primary degenerative or de novo scoliosis develops after skeletal maturity with a mean age at presentation of 7.5 years. The degenerative process begins with the wearing down of the IV disc, leading to the degeneration of the facet joints. When this degeneration occurs faster on one side of the spine compared to the other, an asymmetric collapse develops. Nerve root exiting the foramina is compressed or inflamed due to the spine's degenerative changes such as bony spurs and herniated discs. Lumbar radiculopathy symptoms of shock-like pain, pins and needles, and or numbness can radiate down the buttocks and the leg. While on the other hand, idiopathic or residual scoliosis is a long-standing deformity and sequelae of developmental deformity from childhood. To understand further the pathology of each category, let me compare the features of each type. While a widely accepted classic pattern is attributed to idiopathic scoliosis, the same cannot be extrapolated to de novo scoliosis. More vertebral segments are involved in residual scoliosis in contrast to de novo scoliosis. The thoracic spine is commonly affected in residual scoliosis whereas de novo scoliosis is localized in the lumbar spine. Residual curves are typically of larger magnitude than those seen in adult degenerative curves, but progresses slower compared to de novo scoliosis. With important effects that deformity of the sagittal plane exerts on the health-related quality of life and with the recognition of lumbar lordosis as a key driver of adult spinal deformity, another category in the spectrum emerged. Adult sagittal imbalance can be summarized as the spine losing the sagittal curvature that manifests as loss of lumbar lordosis, forward leaning of the trunk, and posterior rotation of the pelvis. Diminution of lumbar lordosis can be caused by several factors including degenerative changes and iatrogenic changes. Lumbar degenerative kyphosis is considered a form of sagittal imbalance caused by lumbar kyphosis or a marked loss of lumbar lordosis. The cause can be degenerative changes including this space narrowing, collapsed vertebral bodies due to osteoporosis, and atrophy of lumbar extensor muscles. Iatrogenic sagittal deformity is a rapidly growing subtype typically presents in patients after treatment for scoliosis or less complex degenerative diseases in whom sagittal spinal alignment was not preserved or iatrogenically deteriorated. Historically, 
iatrogenic spinal deformity in adults was associated with extensive spinal fusion surgery, but is now more frequently noted after shorter fusion constructs. Malalignment of the spine may occur between two adjacent vertebra. Segmental deformity is defined as an abnormal alignment between individual spinal segments. In this deformity, malalignment between two adjacent vertebra may be translational such as in the case of spondylolisthesis, sagittal and segmental kyphosis, coronal and axial in the case of lateral listhesis or rotatory subluxation. In view of treatment considerations, it is crucial to consider regional and global patterns of scoliosis as well as sagittal and coronal imbalances. Malalignment may occur within regions of the spine. It is characterized by coronal or sagittal deformity within the cervical, thoracic, or lumbosacral regions. Global deformity results when there is a malalignment between the different regions of the spine. Global spinal alignment is determined by the net interaction of each of the regional alignments. In summary, adult spinal deformity is a complex spectrum of spinal diseases that involves a malalignment at the global, regional, or segmental spinal level in an adult. With etiologies that include persistent idiopathic scoliosis, degenerative de novo deformity, and iatrogenic spinal deformity. Furthermore, the clinical relevance of adult spinal deformity is emphasized on sagittal plane alignment as patients' health status depend more on pathology associated with sagittal alignment. And finally, adult spinal deformity is associated with a significant negative impact on health-related quality of life in affected individuals. The following are my references. Thank you for your time.